Aloha and welcome to this week's edition of Business in Hawaii. I'm Daylan Yanagida and we are broadcasting live from the Think Tech studios in downtown Honolulu. If you want to tune in live, we are at www.thinktechhawaii.com. And while there, please subscribe to our programs and get on our mailing list. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to share with you stories of local businesses by local people. And our guests share with us their journey to building a successful business right here at home. In the Think Tech Studios today is Mark Ritchie, Branch Chief with the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Quite a mouthful. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, thank you so Deep much for, for sure. right. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know that there are so many things that DBED does, and so many things that people are not aware that DBED right, does. Right. Um, but first, I want to talk about you, about Mark, and and how you found yourself in this space. And um, before we went live, I said I'm going to assume you have an economics degree. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah. Um, I'm originally from Northern California, but I moved to Hawaii about 14 years ago. And I've worked in economic development and also worked in Silicon Valley at a technology company. And uh, I've worked at a startup here. And I've been working for DBIT for about five years now. And nice. I work in the business development and support division. And I know uh, DBIT has a lot of attached agencies and we do a lot of things. Our division in particular works very closely with uh, companies and trying to grow companies, trying to help them uh, create jobs, grow their businesses, make things in Hawaii, and that sort of thing. And we do that through a variety of uh, programs, everything from export development to our enterprise zone program and, and others. So just from what you see, are there trends as to the, the different types of um, businesses that are looking to be established in Hawaii? Do you see trends like that? Um, I think so. I, I think, you know, we, you know, we have two main pillars of our economy, basically tourism and then also the military. But it's sort of that third leg that our division kind of works with. And we work with organizations like the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, Innovate Hawaii, which works on manufacturing. We uh, do a lot of programs with them as well. And I think we're really trying to work on that, that third leg to try to help diversify the state's economy and also create uh, higher wage jobs and things so that uh, people, not necessarily just so people can stay in Hawaii, but that Hawaii can be an alternative for people to live and be able to uh, live comfortably as opposed to having to move to the mainland. On the Business in Hawaii show, we talked to quite a few startups. Um, we talked to um, a lot of nonprofits. You mentioned that you worked for a startup here yes, in yeah. Hawaii. Tell me um, about your experience in that and, and the business climate. I, you know, I think there was a time where, where people would say, oh, it's, it's, such, it's so unfriendly to, to startups. But I think that's changing. I mean, it... The... Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, business support services out there for startups. I was in a startup that received a lot of uh, federal grants because we were working on projects of interest you know, to the federal government. And you know, there is a lot of federal money out there, uh, for instance, SBIR grants for companies that are just starting out and you know, trying to defray some of that cost for product development or potential product development in the future. I think there's a lot of business support services out there. But it's, we're a small place, but sometimes we're a little bit siloed as well. And I think trying to bring it all together is, is kind of the, the trick. So your experience good? Uh, yes, no, very good, mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. it, it working in a startup, yes. Um, so I know today we want to focus on one of your programs, yeah. um, and I think that it's a program that's that's actually very well known um, yeah. because it it had legs um, right. on the federal side, right. um, and and as you're explaining to me, has now has legs on right. on on the state side. Um, so tell us about Opportunity Zones, about its infancy. How, okay. And, okay, yeah, Opportunity Zones, uh, it was part of the tax package from 2017. In December 2017, it was passed. And this had been around for a couple of years. It initially was bipartisan. And they put the whole um, sort of program, which is really sort of a tax incentive, into that 2017 uh, budget bill that went through. and. Basically, it's uh, trying to take uh, 
uh, capital gains, and there's billions of dollars of capital gains in the U.S. as you know, people cash out of things, you know, from everything from houses to stocks, et cetera, and try to funnel that money or direct that money and give tax incentives for that money to go into economically challenged areas of the country. And so the states, as part of that program, were tasked with uh, nominating opportunity zones. And the criteria for that was a couple of things, but basically, uh, Hawaii had 99 eligible census tracts for that, and it's the same formula they use for new market tax credits. It's based on census data. And from the 99, we were able to choose 25. So we worked very closely with the counties in sort of choosing that 25. We received a lot of guidance from the Treasury Department, nonprofit organizations, National Governors Association, and other entities. And it seems like there was a phone call every week or a webinar on this. And basically, the guidance was in those zones, there should, really should be investable assets, infrastructure. You should already have sort of other economic development programs <laughs> aimed at those areas and, and so forth. So uh, just a quick run through on uh, Hawaii Island, we have six opportunity zones. And it's basically the whole Hilo area. There are four zones there and then two on the Kona side. And that is what was in the, we worked with economic development folks and the, the county planners, and that was their plan to push development um, uh, to kind of what they, you know, their most kind of urban areas on the big island, which would be Hilo and Kona. And then on Maui, it's basically all Kahului and then downtown Wailuku. We do have uh, Molokai and where Kunukakai is. Um, I know it's a small place, but there is opportunity there or somebody to do investment if they were um, in that uh, small in that town. And then on Oahu, the opportunity zones really overlay with the transit-oriented development, basically where the rail stations are going. Pretty much a lot of those were eligible to be opportunity zones, and we know there'll be a lot of development around the rail stations, and we really want to encourage that. We want to encourage housing, affordable housing around there. You know. Uh, workplace businesses be around there and, and other sort of community-based sort of economic development initiatives there so people don't have to get in their cars and things. And then on Kauai, Kauai didn't really get the census tracts they wanted, but they got 100% of what was eligible. And I think it shows how using census tract data sometimes can play you know, trick you a little bit because they really wanted sort of Lahue to be one of them, and unfortunately, that was not eligible. So the two tracks uh, on Kauai was sort of along the South Shore and then up on uh, Hanalei. So in that selection process, that whittling down process from ninety nine to twenty five, and when you um, when these twenty five zones were were selected, was was there was it a, an, an event? where you know, communities could voice their oh, interests? Well, th that would have been nice, but we had to make the assumption that the county plans, because we were working with the county planners and the economic development folks, had already done a lot of outreach with the counties, not specifically for opportunity zones, but for the type of investment and kind of the investment plans they wanted in certain areas. Unfortunately, we were notified, or our governor's office was notified, literally at the beginning of February, 2018, and then we had till like the first week of March or second week of March to actually have everybody signed off on things and then have the governor's office nominate these 25 zones for the Treasury Department. That was sort of the cutoff. So they didn't really give us a lot of time. It was, it was a little bit of a scramble, but we did try to take all the guidance we were given and overlay it with other programs and or to do our due diligence, um, although very quickly, to try to nominate those zones. So what are the incentives for businesses, right. investors? So it, it can be an incentive for just an individual, or it can be a corporation. Uh, and it, it, the, all the money that is involved here comes from capital gains. And, so, and that capital gain can come from anything, anything that a corporation or an LLC or just an individual will put down on their tax forms as a capital gain that can be eligible to go into an opportunity fund, which then has to invest in an opportunity zone. The real tax incentive here is you do have to pay the initial tax on the initial 
capital gain. Although there is some reduction in that for five and seven years, you can get a, a 10% or a 50% reduction. So if it was a million dollar capital gain, if you, if, if you hold for five years, uh, you would only have to pay um, on uh, 90,000. It would be a 10% reduction and then a 15% reduction for seven years. Unfortunately, the program ends in 2026. So because they deployed this so late, people are already kind of foregoing that tax incentive. But the real, the real kicker on this, and this is the way the program is designed, it's designed for patient capital, long-term capital investment. So if you, the Opportunity Fund keeps uh, that investment for 10 years, then you, you know, takes the money out, the, they will owe no capital gains on the appreciation of that investment. So if the initial investment were a million dollars, after 10 years, let's say it's $3 million, then that investor gets $2 million that there's no capital gain due on. So you also mentioned <clears throat> that uh, the Opportunity Zone um, program is a, was a, or is a federal program. Right, right, or a federal tax incentive, yeah. Um, but that the state... Right, the state now conforms to federal tax law regarding Opportunity Zones. When the program first came out, for the first year of the program, uh, in 2018, we uh, did not conform to federal tax law regarding opportunity zones. In other words, after that 10 years, you would owe Hawaii state capital gains tax. But we were only one of a handful of states that did not conform. And so in the conformity bill that was introduced in the legislature this last round, they put that in that they would conform to federal tax law regarding opportunity zones. So as of July 1st, we now conform to federal tax law. And I think and the reason this was done it, it was because we made ourselves uncompetitive vis-a-vis -vis most other states in the United States to try to get investment capital into some of our opportunities. Why was it that the state, the DOE tax or the state of Hawaii didn't want to comply initially? I, I don't think, I think this all happened so fast. I think it was just a default because there's changes in federal tax law all the time. And so I think that just... It was something they hadn't even really studied, and it was it, it happened so fast that it just they wanted to be able to study it before they were going to say we're conformed to it. And mm -hmm. so DBID was you know had meetings with OTAX, and you know kind of it had a long discussion about sort of the pros and cons. But I think the fact that it made us sort of uncompetitive vis-a-vis -vis other states. Nice. Um, when we come back from a break, short break, we want to talk about DBID the services that you offer, how people can get involved, inquire about Opportunity Zones, and then you can share with us a whole lot more about the program and, and, and where it's going and things that we can look forward to. Okay, thank you. We are going to take that break. This is Business in Hawaii. We'll see you back here shortly. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Munley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii. With us today is Mark Ritchie from the Department of Business Economic Development and Tourism. Again, the mouthful. <laughs> but what I wanted to start the second half with is um, a snapshot of your web page because yes. it in itself can yeah. point to so many resources. Right. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. We have sort of a dedicated web page for the Hawaii Opportunity Zones. And in there, we have um, maps that you can download, but also GIS maps that you can zoom in on. You can get to street level to see where the zones are. We have fact sheets on the zones and cluster of zones and some of the, the demographics. 
uh, kind of uh, real estate information and sort of investment priorities and sort of assets in those places. Uh, just and it's this is sort of a really good uh, resource page. Um, you can get to it by going to invest.hawaii.gov forward slash oz, and it'll take you right to that page. We'll make sure that we get that up on, on, yeah. the, on the link somewhere. Um, so people reach out to you, and you folks put together quite a few programs. Um, to provide educational opportunities about Opportunity Zones. Tell us about that. Yes, yes. We have a, uh, an event uh, coming up October the 17th, which will be uh, downtown here, and it's an update on understanding Opportunity Zones. We have two people coming in from the mainland, a tax lawyer who's done uh, extensive speaking across the country and extensive work on Opportunity Zones, and then uh, a, an accountant from uh, Novogratic, uh, and he's going to be sort of doing a deep dive into uh, opportunity zones uh, from an investor point of view, but also from a, we'll look at particularly from the lawyer's point, tax lawyer's point of view, Mark Schultz, from uh, an investee's point of view, um, somebody looking for an opportunity fund investment. And it'll be a pretty deep dive. We're partnering with the uh, Hawaii Society for Certified Public Accountants, and they're offering continuing education units for this and then also with the Hawaii Community Reinvestment Corporation. And it'll be here downtown here at Fuller Hall at the uh, YWCA from uh, 9 o'clock to about, we'll probably go up to about 2 o'clock if there's a lunch involved. Is there a sign up for that? Uh, yes, so you go ahead and register. If you go to invest.hawaii.gov forward slash OZ, go to the events page and there's registration links. A separate registration link for the accountants if they want the continuing education units and then another link for everybody else. So uh, we also said um, that there was a quick ramp up for you folks um, yes. <laughs> for the program. Yeah. Oh, ha have you gotten much traction? Yeah. Well, DBIT's role in this, it's a little bit interesting. I mean, this is a federal tax incentive, but now we also have the state tax incentive where we conform to federal tax law on this. But th there's not a whole lot of reporting requirements, and y y this is very private sector driven. So DBIT's role in this is really to provide a lot of information Fact sheets, kind of market our zones, let people know what investment possibilities might be there. We're doing a series of uh, workshops in, in November that is looking at sort of community-based projects that will be in our zones, trying to get them investment ready. And then we're looking at trying to promote those projects, 10 or 15, 20 projects, to uh, local investors or opportunity funds. Uh, and even uh, mainland investors to let uh, you know, kind of the country know that we do have uh, a lot of great things happening in our opportunity zones and some really worthwhile projects. As an economic development agency, we're looking for projects that you know tick some boxes in terms of community-based economic development, workforce housing or low-income housing component, uh, creating jobs, uh, company expansions in sort of distressed areas those sorts of things. In each of the projects that we want to profile, we want to be able to succinctly say, from a community-based economic development point of view, why this is important. So how do you get the messaging out for, uh, to mainland investors? So, you know, um, my guess that's, is that- That's the upcoming step that oh, okay. we're going to be working on, yes. Oh, okay. yes. Okay. And we'll probably be profiling things on our website. We might even do, um, we, actually, we actually already have East Coast investors express interest in Hawaii's Opportunity Zones. And so we will have a kind of a well-developed marketing plan once we get our 10 to 15 projects that we really want to profile and uh, try to run with that. And that'll probably be in the new year we'll be starting that. I know that there are a lot of folks who are going to want to know um, the, the success rate of Opportunity Zones. And, I, and when we were talking earlier, you said that's forthcoming. Um, do we know? We're when looking we'll be at, be, because uh, the tax bill in 2017 was passed under reconciliation, the original uh, program, so to speak, had a um, certification plan where if you were going to be or create a, an opportunity fund, you uh, would have to be certified by the Treasury Department, and then you had to do like annual reporting, where the investments were going, which zones, what type of investments, those sorts of things. And then the Treasury Department was then supposed to be writing a report. Because the bill was passed under reconciliation, meaning that I guess they had less than 60 votes, all of the non-budget part of it was stripped out. 
So it's been introduced in both houses of Congress to put all that back, but I don't know the status of where that'll go. So to your point, what we can do is we can report on our projects that we're trying to promote, you know, our 10 to 15, that we kind of falls into our CBED or our community-based economic development program. But if somebody were to say, how much um, opportunity fund capital went into a particular opportunity zone in Hawaii, that'd be very difficult for us to um, probably calculate just because they haven't put in the tracking mechanisms. There may be ways around that, and we're trying to explore that, like with no tax, DCCA, you know, that, that sort of thing. But. So with the structuring of the, the Hawaii opportunity zones and the rollout, you've got some informational sessions coming up. Uh, what about uh, opportunity zones and their successes in other states? Are, have we modeled, have we? There, there's been uh, news articles. I think people have seen like in the New York Times or Washington Post, and sometimes they're somewhat negative, some of the articles. And I think the reason is, and we said this last year when we did our just understanding opportunity zones uh, session, we had almost 150 people show up for that one. But a lot of these projects were already like shovel ready or already in progress. And then an opportunity fund kind of jumped in and did an investment. Hawaii doesn't really have a whole lot of those types of projects. And because people are still, you know, trying to get shovel ready, going through permitting and doing those sorts of things. And so I think a lot of the initial money went to projects that were already going to happen anyway. Now, as we get towards 2026, the end of this, the investment period, um, you know, hopefully maybe that'll change and we'll actually start seeing money go into different areas. There are over 8,000 opportunity zones in the United States. So it'll be interesting to see where investment money goes and if some zones get any money at all. But I think kind of the jury's out on that right now. Mm -hmm. So as we, as we learn about opportunity zones here locally, um, what is, what is your hope? What, what, what do you hope to see in terms of that result? Yeah, I hope to see, you know, uh, again, kind of deep ed's role as maybe a, a sort of a facilitator and, you know, kind of putting that information out that we could have some good, you know, 10 to 15 kind of community-based projects that tick a lot of boxes for community-based economic development, sort of new services in communities that um, don't have a lot, uh, new employment, maybe high wage job employment. Uh, housing is always an issue here, and affordable housing is a big thing. So, if we could get some of those under our belt, um, I would be very happy with that. Do you have any uh, legislators championing your cause along with you? I think so. I mean, we're going to invite legislators to our October 17th event because I think just a lot of people are not um, as up to speed on opportunity zones. And on the mainland, I think it's the same way, but that's why we're bringing kind of some national experts that have done a real deep dive into this area to come to Hawaii, because we need to sort of create the uh, Opportunity Zone uh, ecosystem. In other words, you, you know, we need to have tax lawyers in Hawaii that can advise clients on how to structure a deal, how you get your money out after 10 years, we need accountants that know the right tax forms and how to, to structure these sorts of things. And so that's kind of something we're trying to create with by doing these sessions. Do you find that uh, potential investors are going to be um, hesitant because the, the ramp up is, is not, you said the program ends in 2026? Right, and the final rules aren't even out yet. They're supposed oh. to be, the final administrative rules are, are supposed to be out by the end of this year. But people are still making investments, and there is, you know, sort of a legal concept that if you sort of rely on current guidance, there's already been, I think, about two tranches of stuff that have come out. So th there are investments happening already, but some people are, you know, just a little bit hesitant because there's still some ambiguity. And that's the type of thing we'll cover on, on October 17th in our session. So aside from the October 17th session, where else can we find you? Yeah. Um, um, well, we'll be sessions? doing workshops. If you go to our website, uh, under events, we're asking people that might have potential projects if they like to sign up with us. And we'll be doing workshops on Oahu, and this will be in November on Oahu, and then uh, all the neighbor islands will be doing workshops if we have enough people. And the idea there is to try to get those projects investment ready so that when 
we start marketing to opportunity funds or potential investors, either locally or on the mainland, that they're ready to go and um, their chances of success will be increased in like getting some opportunity zone uh, uh, funding. Yeah. My guess is that um, those marketing plans to, to go to market is going to come after um, the final rules are released? Uh, probably, yes. Yeah, we're sort of looking at possibly doing a uh, um, project showcase of maybe 10, 15, 20 projects going on in Hawaii, inviting mainland opportunity fund investors uh, or uh, managers, fund managers, and also local investors. Um, according to DOE tax, I think it changes on a year to year basis, but just the, the um, figure for capital gains that people declare on their Hawaii state tax forms, you know, is roughly $2 billion. So there's not that all that would go into an opportunity fund, but there's a lot of local money from capital gains that could be, in, uh, that people might want to invest and invest locally and keep it there for 10 years and be able to kind of see their investment. Is there any uh, motivation to, to attract more local investors than mainland investors? Um, Yes, we've sort of just, we're, we're, we're kind of backing into some of that now. And on October the 17th, when we do that session, we really are going to do a deep dive into creating your own uh, opportunity fund. Because it can just be a, a single individual for a single investment. It could be a group of individuals for a single investment. Or it could be a whole group of individuals to go into a fund that will have a fund manager that then will either do one investment or maybe multiple investments across Hawaii or across the US. I would love to see an announcement where somebody is putting together a Hawaii Opportunity Fund in, to invest just in Hawaii's Opportunity Zones and to take investment for anybody in Hawaii with a capital gain. That hasn't happened yet. Well, so uh, everyone that, that watches your YouTube clip now has heard it, yeah, that that's what it. you're looking for. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I want to make sure that your viewers know where to find this information on Opportunity Zones. If you could give us that website address again yes. and how to reach yes. you. Yes, and that's kind of our workspace. So anything we're doing should will we'll go up there. It's uh, invest.hawaii.gov forward slash OZ. Perfect. Uh, Mark, I really appreciate the information that you've shared. I, I think because it's um, territory that hasn't been really explored and because you folks are still awaiting the, the, the final right. rules right. on it, um, but I know that quite a few people have been talking about it. It's, you know, it's, it's yeah. all the hype, if you will, oh, good. <laughs> um, for, for business development. Yeah. So thank you again for yeah. joining us. We look forward My to pleasure. having DBED. Yeah. Um, on future shows to talk about all the other amazing programs that you folks um, shepherd there. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you to Mark and DBED for joining us. Big thank you to the awesome production staff here in the studio. If you would like to be a guest on the show, please like us and subscribe and leave a comment below. Business in Hawaii airs every Thursday at 2 p.m. and we look forward to seeing you here next week.